everybody. Uh, welcome to Quant Field Co Lecture on Mathematics in Our Time. Uh, today is the eighth lecture in the annual series, series honoring our late colleague, Dr. Quant Field Co. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Annie Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Harvard University in 1989. Her PhD in mathematics from University of California at Berkeley in 1995. After serving for one year as Benjamin Harris instructor at Harvard, she joined the mathematics faculty at Northwestern University, earning the rank of full professor in 2005. She joined the University of Chicago in 2012. In 2011, Dr. Wilkinson was awarded the Ruth Little Center Prize from the American Mathematical Society for her remarkable contribution to the field of ergodic theory of partial hyperbolic dynamical system. The Center Prize is awarded every two years to a woman who has made outstanding contribution to mathematics research over the previous five years. In 2013, Dr. Wilkinson was named a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. Floor is yours, please. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. No, no, it should go up. Okay. I can also speak really loudly if I want to, but um, oh, microphones, program microphones. All right. Now, now it's probably too loud. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here to honor the legacy of Dr. Ko um, and his commitment to teaching and communication and learning. Um, and I hope to contribute just a maybe a small amount to that tradition. Um, I'm here at North Carolina State, one of the very top uh, engineering schools uh, in the country. Uh, has a famous stat department, um, excellent math department, applied math in particular. So my impression of North Carolina State is that there's a great appreciation, certainly for the sciences, but in particular for the applied sciences. So what I'm going to do is talk about pure mathematics with absolutely no applications. And some of you will probably think, you know, oh wait, does this maybe have an application? And the answer is possibly yes, because most pure mathematics ultimately finds application, in, in my experience, or at least in my opinion. So, but this is um, some beautiful work of a mathematician named Maria Mersikani and her collaborators. Mersikani was um, the first woman to win the Fields Medal in mathematics, which is the equivalent, essentially the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. It's given out every four years to, math to mathematicians under the age of 40, um, usually four or so. Um, and Maria, Mariam's work, I mean, I knew her, and I was somewhat familiar, certainly quite appreciative of her work, um, was in an area, the area called dynamical systems, uh, which is my area of research. Uh, and unfortunately, she, she died young um, at the age of 40 in 2017. But her legacy is, is tremendous, and uh, her work, the, the work she was awarded the Fields Medal for was on um, classifying SL2R invariant measures on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Um, so I am not going to explain a single word in that. It was highly technical, very deep work, as well as some of her other work. Uh, and I'm going to try to give you kind of the spirit of some of the work she did, and the mathematical world that she lived in. So the universe, the mathematical universe that she occupied. So on the on screen, I have a piece of calligraphy. Uh, it's a quote from the 13th century Persian um, mystic poet, Rumi, a well, very well-known uh, poet. And um, the original translation given for this piece of calligraphy Calligraphy was something like, uh, if you want to, if you want some light, you have to start a fire. But a friend of mine uh, who, who speaks Farsi um, 
looked at this and told me that, in fact, the, 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 the better interpretation of, of this calligraphy, this, this piece of verse, is uh, if you want to light up the world, you must burn like the sun. So it's a very intense piece of poetry, and it describes well Maria Mershkani. So I'll say a little bit more about her later, but the focus is going to be on her work and on mathematics. Now I have to make sure this works. Ah, you have to turn it on if you want to you know, advance your slides. You have to turn on your clip as well. So now, <laughs> there's probably something else you have to do. Um, this was working. There we go. Okay. So the title of this talk is The Illumination Problem. And it refers to a classical problem that was posed sometime in the 50s. Let me give you a little background for it. So suppose that you shine a light. What does it do? Turn on a light, it lights up its surroundings. Because the light bulb emits light from all directions. And these particles or waves or whatever you want to, let's just think of them as rays. The rays of light travel in a straight line. And they hit every, they go everywhere they can until they're blocked by something. And so if I have a square room and I shine a light, a rectangular room, uh, it will be, the whole room will be illuminated. Um, in particular, any point in that room can be reached by that ray of light emanating from that light bulb. So now let's examine what happens when we place a light bulb in a room that is not a square room. Well, let's start with a class of rooms, of shapes, called convex shapes. Convex shapes, excuse me, have the property that if I take any two points on the inside, I can connect them by a line segment that stays on the inside of the room. That's the definition of what it means to be convex. So there's a, a, an example of a convex room. So if you have a convex room, and you have a light source anywhere in the room, that since any point can be connected to the, line, the light source by uh, a line segment, every point in the room will be illuminated by a light bulb placed anywhere in the room. Now what if instead of a convex room, you have a room that's like, like this sort of groovy, kidney-shaped 60s hangout pad. Okay. And suppose, furthermore, you paint the walls black. Okay. In this case, if I put a light source over there and I take a point, say, over there in the room, uh, that point will not get any light. There will be shadows. There will be whole areas of the room that are shadowed because that, there's no way for the light to travel from that point to that from the light source to the point. But we could take our groovy 60s kidney-shaped room and put mirrored walls more appropriately. Uh, what happens in that case? Or just paint them a very bright white? Well, as we know, light reflects uh, with an equal angle of um, incidence and reflection uh, across mirrored surfaces. And so in this case, the problem becomes much trickier because a ray of light could bounce many, 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 many times uh, on the walls as many times as you want. The question of whether it could hit that spot over there now becomes a very non-trivial uh, problem, as we mathematicians like to say. So I want to focus on a certain class of non-convex rooms, or some of them will be convex, in which deep mathematics can tell you something about which points can be illuminated from which other points. So, Back in 1958, the physicist slash mathematician Roger Penrose created a room addressing the question of whether, given any room with mirror walls, you can get from any point to any other point in the room. He constructed this interesting example of a room that's made out of an ellipse shape, where you cut the ellipse at some point and you slide these two halves apart. And then you make a kind of a mushroom shape, as indicated. Those are also pieces of ellipse on the inside. 
The Penrose Room has a very interesting property that if you put your light source there, you can get everywhere in the room, except you can't get that little that little square there will always stay in shadow. There is a little shadowed area of the room that will not be hit. But if I put a light source somewhere else, that's an entirely different question. Um, and as you can see, it would be a very complicated question. So I'm trying to hammer home the point that predicting where a light source goes in this mirrored room over long term, over long time, is a, is a pretty tricky question. It's a question <clears throat> that belongs to dynamical systems. So Tukarski, uh, much more recently, created a room with an even, to my mind, an even more remarkable property. So it's a 26-sided room. It's polygonal. But the, the walls of the room are all straight. And in fact, the angles are all basically 45 degrees, 135 degrees, 90 degrees. But in this particular room, it has a remarkable property that if I put a light source at precisely one spot, there's one specific spot in the center of the square ish piece. And I stand, say, over here. I turn on the light over here. The light will go everywhere in this room except for that one spot. Now, of course, that's not right there. That's a purely mathematical thing I just told you. Because a spot has no thickness, it's a point, right? And the light source is also a point. And what this says, if I take any other point in this room, I can find some you know, light bouncing around that gets there. But I can never get exactly to that point. OK? So I hope you will give me some mathematical abstraction here. Suck that. Um, but another way of describing it, if, if this phenomenon, is that um, if I had a Tarski billiard table, and let's pretend like there's no friction. Everything bounces with any, without any loss of energy. And everything is a point as opposed to having actual thickness. That if I, I was, uh, if this were my move, uh, I lose. <laughs> there's no way that I can uh, hit this ball so that it, it even touches the eight ball. OK. so. The term billiard is one that's used a lot of mathematics. Uh, it's used to model physical phenomena such as the motion of gas particles with an ideal gas, for example. And when a mathematician talks about a billiard table, we mean some shape like this with, uh, with a boundary like this and a game whereby you take a point anywhere on the inside, you put it in any, you kick it off in any direction, and then you let it bounce as long as you want. Okay, so there's lots of interesting questions in billiards. And um, there's a class of billiards, which includes the Tarkovsky table. And these are called rational billiards. So why are they called rational billiards? Because of rational numbers, not because of some sensibility of these tables. The, and what's a rational number? A rational number is not a number that makes a lot of sense and whatever. It's a ratio. It's a ratio of whole numbers. So this is an example of a rational billiard table. And my definition, here's my definition of a rational billiard table. Here's the definition. A billiard table is rational if the angles written in degrees are all rational numbers. So for example, if they're whole numbers, that's a rational billiard table. So here, the angles are all 135 and 90 degrees. Those are whole numbers. So in particular, they're rational numbers. So that's a rational billiard table. Rational billiard tables have some really interesting properties that I'd like to tell you about. So here's something that you can do with a rational billiard table. And let me, before I do it, I do it in this example, let me explain what I want to do. So imagine that I hit a ball in my billiard table in the direction indicated by that arrow. So as it bounces against the walls of the table, the directions are going to change. 
right? So in this particular case, I, I could see this, and if I bounce there, then I, I can see things in this direction. In this particular table, there are four possible directions that a billiard ball can go, given a starting direction. And suppose I want to keep track of a billiard ball where it's bouncing, but I want to straighten out those directions by creating a larger object in which these angly, bouncy trajectories become straight lines. I can do that with the rational billiard table using a process called unfolding. And so here's an unfolding of this rational billiard table. I flip it four times, and I get back to where I started. And in this flipping process, you'll see that all possible directions are now accounted for in the, the, the flips of this original direction. So let me illustrate what's so special about this unfolded rational billiard table. So I flipped it in all possible ways until I got back to where I started, until I got all the possible directions. The remarkable property that this unfolded table has is that if I glue, if I do an identification, and I'll illustrate this like about five times for you, if I identify the right edges of this table, then my billiard trajectories that were all angly become straight lines. And so I've illustrated the actual identifications here using color. My apologies if you're colorblind. Later I will use numbers to indicate the uh, identification. But what I mean by the colors in this picture is that I want any point that's on this pink line here to be thought of as the same as the point on the opposite pink edge. Okay? So if my billiard ball or gray of light or whatever hits over here, instead of bouncing across, I'm going to continue up here. If I go across here and hit here, I'm not going to bounce. I'm going to go over like that. Okay? On the left, I've shown you the original billiard table. And what I want you to witness is how the ball, starting in this direction, hit in a certain direction. If you're allowing these rules, and you're allowing it to visit these kind of phantom tables, right? this is just a copy of the table that's been flipped. If you allow that, then the billiard trajectory over here turns into straight lines over here. So I'll show the movie twice. So you see, boom, every time it hits, every time it bounces over there, corresponds to hitting an edge, one of these edges of these shadow tables and either going across or just continuing. So that complicated looking billiard orbit on the left looks like this really straight trajectory of, of, of the line where you have a certain rule about what happens when you hit the edges of the table. I'll show you that one more time. Yes, I will. Go ahead. Yeah, one more time. Boom. You have to kind of look back and forth. But every time it hits, 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 it corresponds to crossing. Okay. So now I want to imagine, I want you to imagine living in the world described by this billiard table, this unfolded table. So I live in a world where I can just, everything is, is looking pretty flat and reasonable, it just looks like this octagon. Except if I happen to go across one of these edges, I come back to where I started. Okay. Well, let's try to imagine, now I've numbered the edges that uh, align with each other. Let's try to imagine what happens when we glue the edges. So imagine, well, two and two are the same, so what if to take this table and try to glue two and two together, what would we get? So glue. Okay. So let's do first some warm-ups on this problem. Okay. 
Okay. So here's something. It's not quite the same as an unfolded billiard table, but it's a, it's a gluing problem. So what if we take this cross-shaped object and we glue the edges, which are not parallel anymore, but how do we glue according to these identifications? Let me let you think about it for a minute. Tell me what you get. One. Yes, a cube. Correct. And in fact, I can give you little folding guides, which I think makes it even clearer. Right? If you fold according to these edges and you imagine kind of bringing these red and orange and so on together, folding and gluing, you will end up with a cube. So that's sort of the baby warm up. We've done that. I think we can all visualize that because all we had to do was fold. We didn't have to do anything worse to this piece of paper to make it into a cube. All right, but, but let's do one that's a little bit harder. Now, for those of you who grew up like me, kind of grew up in the 80s, uh, this is a very familiar object. And in fact, uh, if, if, if you're me or you're a gamer, uh, living on a world with identifications is nothing, no big deal. Because if you've played Pac-Man, or in this case, um, asteroids, you live in such a world, right? So what happens in, in the game Pac-Man or asteroids, I mean, how do you kind of keep this world contained in, in a video game square, is when an object goes across here, it comes across on the opposite side, the same opposite side. Now for those of you who have played these games, uh, have you ever wondered what is like the shape of the world that this is taking place in? Well, in some sense, the best way to represent this world is, is just like that, a flat square where if you go across, you come back to where you started. But if you're a topologist, you might want to think a little bit more, is this world, for example, a cube? Is it a sphere? What is the, the, the shape of this world? All right, so we have this world in which opposite edges are glued together. What do we get? So there's a mind experience, uh, kind of a mind, we can do this, just drawing just with our hands. So if we first glue the orange edges together, we now have a cylinder, right? And we have a pink edge up here, and a pink edge down here, and those two circles need to be glued together. Now how do we glue those? Well now we're going to have to distort this piece of paper, and kind of bend it. But if we do, we can glue those two together, and what we end up with is the surface of a donut, what's called a torus. Okay, what mathematicians would call a torus. And so this is something different than a cube. Um, the kind of surfaces that Mario Mursicani worked on were a little more complicated, so they might look something like this. So let's go through the same exercise of actually figuring out what this looks like by gluing opposite edges. So I spent some time trying to make an animation of this. So let's rotate our piece of paper a little bit so we have some room in three dimensions to work. And now let's bend and bring together the orange edges. So we do that and we have a cylindrical shape except that the top and bottom are not just two circles, but they have these three edges, and we have to glue those edges according to that identification given by the colors. Okay. So I'm going to fold it. So now the orange thing is sort of like the spine of this object, and I'm going to bring together the pink edges. And so we fold this, and we bring together the pink edges. I'm going to rotate it as I fold it, and we glue them. And now we have a donut, except we've got a missing square in the middle. And there's two more edges, two pairs of edges that still need to be glued. So let's ignore the other edges. We've already done that gluing. And let's focus on the square. And now if the surface of our torus is made of rubber, we can rotate that square. In fact, it doesn't even have to be shaped like a square. We can rotate it so it's easier to see what happens when we do the identifications. And so now I'm just going to move that over. I'm going to pull out that little 
square thing. Now let's let's do that. <laughs> and now let's glue together the green edges. There we go. And now let's ignore the green. And now we just have two red circles that need to be glued. And we see what we get is a donut but with two holes, a type of crawler. So this is yes. This is called a genus two surface or a two hole torus. All right. And in fact, um, the rational billiards that we are going to talk about can always be unfolded to produce surfaces like this. So what about this example we just saw? We unfold it. We get this unfolded table with the identifications. We've turned billiard orbits into lines. <coughs> and now if we want to see what shape this is, we've just seen that if we glue all the edges together, which distorts the surface, but gives us some information about the shape of that object. It's a, what's called a two-hole torus, or a genus two surface. That's going to be, we're now going to talk about surfaces. We're going to talk about things you can do to surfaces that make it easier to understand billiard trajectories. Or things we can do on surfaces that help us understand what lines on these surfaces do. Okay, so that billiard I gave you, by the way, that rational billiard is pretty boring because it was convex. So we already know that if I shine a light somewhere in there, it's going to light up the whole thing. So let's take a more interesting, non-convex rational billiard. Here's an example. And let's unfold it. Well, this is actually from a paper by McMullen, McConnell, and Wright. They studied this particular rational uh, billiard table. So if you do the unfolding, you get this translation surface. It's called a translation surface because it's a surface and it has, you can draw lines on it. And they'll come up. They have opposite edges glued, this essentially, or parallel edges glued. Okay, so now, what happens when you glue that? Okay, we're not going to do that. Okay. Um, I did that in the privacy of my own home. And what you get is a surface with four holes. Okay, well, there's some scratch work. So, a mathematician would look at that surface and they would not try to glue it together. They would use something called Euler's formula to determine what's called the Euler characteristic, and then from that, the genus. And this is my little calculation. I had to figure out the number of you know, distinct um, points, or vertices, and there's distinct edges, and there's one face, and so you get this formula on that. Okay. So that particular surface is quite a bit more complicated from the point of view of topology, the number of holes. Now, we have some picture in our head now about that surface. We can think of it either as the, the Pac-Man game, where you just have to follow the identifications if you want to see where you're going. We can also, in the back of our heads, think of this as a fancy donut with four holes in it. So, now, I want to talk about things you can do to surfaces. And I, there's very special things that we can do to surfaces that won't change lines. I mean, it'll take lines to lines. Parallel lines go to parallel lines. Okay? So there's certain transformations. And, and now we're getting into the world where where Bruce Connie lived. Kind of. So her universe, or one of her many beautiful universes, was a space consisting of surfaces. So each point in this space, which is very high dimensional, like for this particular surface that has two holes, this would be a six dimensional space. That's just with two holes. A six dimensional space, and each point in that space is a surface. And in this space, she could move, navigate around the space, going from surface to surface using certain rules. And this navigation, like the properties of these rules of how you can navigate had immediate implications. I mean, it's beautiful in its own right, but it had immediate interpretations in terms of straight line 
billiards. Okay, so let's let's talk about what can we do to a surface to kind of move around and give ourselves other surfaces. Now all these surfaces will continue to have the same number of holes. But what we're doing is we're changing lines on the surfaces. Alright, so that sounds scary, but let me now describe to you the things we can do to surfaces. They're not the things we actually do aren't that scary. So we can take our original surface, we can rotate it. Okay, that really doesn't change the surface itself, but it does change directions on the surface. Right? So if I rotate by 90 degrees, if I was going in this direction, now I'm going in this direction. The actual surface is kind of the same. Well, what else can we do? We can dilate the surface, scale the surface, not dilate, scaling the surface. And all these moves that I'm doing, I, I just I want them to keep the area fixed. Okay, I don't want to mess with the area of the surface. Okay? So these things I've described, there's the same kind of area. So this is a scaled surface, a surface that's been squished by some factor and stretched by its reciprocal. And then finally, this is kind of the weirder one, this is a shearing operation. So it, it's, you know, it's an application of a matrix, a very simple matrix. But what is a shear? A shear, well, you're engineers, so my, you, know, you can tell me what a shear is, right? It's this kind of motion, right? So there's a shearing operation. And these transformations of surfaces, so notice after I did all those transformations, we still have the gluings of parallel edges. Okay, so we still have these lines. Okay, um, we can combine these transformations. So I've given you some very basic types of transformation. What about how might we combine these? So I could say rotate the surface and then scale it. Why not? And now I have the new surface. And this, you'll notice, we still have parallel. The identifications are always between parallel line segments of the same length. So if I were to glue this all together, I would still get, I would still get, I haven't changed the kind of nature of this object. I would still get a two-hole torus. But now lines are different. And you'll see why this matters. Like right now, it probably seems a little strange. OK, so here's one way of combining transformations. Or I could take this. I could shear it horizontally. And then I could shear it vertically, which is the same as just rotating and shearing and rotating back again. But you do a vertical shear, and now I, I get a Okay, so there's this idea of being able to compose these different motions, these different transformations of tables, and get for surfaces, and get new surfaces. And you'll notice in this particular example, if I do a horizontal shear and a vertical shear, I got the same thing as rotating scale rotating. And so this gives some, this actually gives some, some richness and complexity to the kind of things I can do to surfaces. There are, there are rules, there are laws that these transformations have to obey. In math words, these generate, this is a group of transformations. In fact, it's a group. If you know what it is, you know what it is. And if you don't, I'm not going to say. So it's a group of transformations. And in this particular case, this horizontal shear plus vertical shear, no matter what surface I start with, it's, it's true in this example, but it's true for any surface, if I do those two moves, it's the same as doing those three moves. Okay. So this adds some complexity. So now you can imagine living in a space where each point in your space is a surface. And I have these different rules to move from one point in the space to another. And you might ask, where can I get by following these rules? Now, there's one more thing I haven't mentioned, which is you can imagine if I apply like this rule for a very long time, and I stretch and I stretch and I stretch. If this is a very unwieldy surface to work with, right? I've suddenly produced a very long and skinny thing. It's very hard to even see. But there's a notion of equivalence. So two, two of these surfaces being the same. And it's called cutting and reassembling. 
So for example, look at this surface. I am free to cut across from any corner to any other corner and then take those pieces and I have to identify the, the things that were identified before. And I have to keep track of, I've created new identifications by cutting. So if I do that, I just get another surface. This is identical to the original surface. It's identical in every possible way. Okay. So it's, in, in the universe of surfaces, I've done something and it's actually taking me back to the same surface. Okay, so those are actually the same. Okay, so we can imagine combining these different, different operations of transforming, then reassembling, and then you could transform again, right? And you're getting this sequence of surfaces. So there's things you can do with the surfaces. Okay, why? Why are we doing this? Okay, well, first of all, it's a deep and beautiful math. There's a deep and beautiful mathematical question connected to this. And I even want to show you what all this has to do with the elimination problem. <coughs> so now I'd just like to mention the work of, this is a picture of Marion Rusconi. Um, just tell you a little bit about her life. She was uh, born in Iran, in Tehran. And she was educated there as a girl, and even uh, she got her, her undergraduate degree at Shirley University, which is still the top university there. And uh, she then uh, went to Harvard University and got her PhD there, working with uh, Kurt McMullen, who is also a fields medalist, working with the animal system. Uh, after that, she had some postdoctoral positions, uh, and she ended up as a professor at Stanford. And that's where she was working when she when she died. Um, she she received the 2014 uh, Fields Medal. She was one of four Fields Medalists in, in 2014. And as I said before, she was the first woman to win the Fields Medal. Uh, when she was very sick, actually no, I'm not going to politicize here. But you can imagine that um, you know she passed away in 2017. And you can think a little bit. You know, family was still living in Iran, and you can think a little bit about maybe the political situation um, between our country and Iran at the time, anyway. But uh, Mariam worked, so now I, I want to tell you what her field's final result was about, and as I said, she worked in this, she lived in this world populated by, by surfaces. Um, you can find pictures of her on the internet where she spread out huge pieces of paper on the floor and she would just do drawings and calculations and so on on these huge pieces of paper. And you kind of imagine she needed that space to think about this, this kind of world. So what did she do? What is her field mental work? Well, it's joint work with uh, Alex Eskin uh, and another uh, Iranian-American, Amir Mohammadi. So there's two works, one with Eskin, the other with Eskin and Mohammadi. And here's what they proved. So start with any surface. Okay, or if you like, start with any billiard table. But this is even more general, any rational billiard table. Start with any surface, just a polygon with parallel edges identified so that it glues up to give you a surface. And now consider all the surfaces that can be obtained the original surface by this process of stretching or transforming, shearing, rotating, stretching, and so on, along with reassembly, when you want to make your picture look nicer. Um, what do you got? What do you got? So what, what they proved, what they did was to give a precise description of the types of surfaces that can be obtained, starting with and it really, and so when I say a precise description, it's not like a recipe. It's not like, oh, here's a surface. Here's all the surfaces you can get. Like, how do you even say that? So it's a precise description in the world 
the universe of all surfaces. And basically, if you start with a surface and you do these operations, and you look at what you get, and you kind of smooth things out a little bit, close things up, you're going to get a really, really nice object from the space of all surfaces called a submanifold. And this is a, a, a very, a very special feature of this type of dynamical system. Okay, so this is this is what they they did, just in plain language, given a surface, and say something about all the surfaces you can get to. Um, and so what's the connection now going back to the illumination problem? Okay, so here again is a surface that's been transformed and then cut and reassembled and then transformed again. Okay. Now I want you to go back and think about the question of can you connect two points on the surface by a line segment? Which is the same as the question, maybe a very long line segment, which is the same as the question of my, of my rational billiard table, given a starting point and giving an ending point, can I hit the ball so that it hits the other? Okay. Well, so I want you to sort of think about backing up this process. Okay, so let's imagine you start with that table, and that's your starting point. Suppose you get over here, and now, suppose I have two points that are super close, right? That happen to be very super close, and they can be connected by a line, a line segment. Super close points can always be connected. Let's see where they came from. So there was a transformation that was applied. Right? And what happens to that segment is it goes to a different segment. And the segment's in a different direction, but it's still a line segment. And maybe it's a little bit longer. Right? In this case, it's maybe a little bit shorter, actually. And it happens because now if we go back one more step, so this is undoing the reassembly, that little line segment, now it's a line segment. It's not an obvious line segment. Like this was an obvious connection. You could all see that. This one, not quite as obvious because it's going across you know, one of these uh, walls, one of these edges. And now we back it up over here. We undo the transformation. Now maybe it's a little less obvious. But now imagine going back and back and back and back. So imagine going forward, 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 so way off into the future and back things up, you can imagine that you could start with a very, very simple, easy to see connection. And by backing it up, you might get a very, very long, unobvious connection. And so this is a consequence, so I can't explain it. And it was actually, it wasn't proved by them, the consequence, I will give you a reference in a minute, but it uses this major result of estimating and and here's what it shows. So now start with a billiard table and two points, or, or I guess we're starting with the surface. But for now, let's just talk about surfaces. So here's two points on the surface that it's not obvious can you connect them, right? Because they certainly can't get connected this way. But as a consequence of what they proved, if you transform and you reassemble this enough times, you can always make those two points super close on your new table. That's a consequence of their theorem. That's a pretty crazy thing. Given any two points, well, not quite any two points, all but basically any two points. <laughs> I'll tell you the one little exception, which is like a Minkowski table, right? can't do this with this two point. Anyway, basically two points you can get them close together on a new table by doing the right cutting and reassembly and transformations. And now when you back it up, that tiny little connection gets transformed into a potentially very long connection connecting those two points. So any point, so here's the, here's the theorem that follows. Any point on the table, well, here's the statement. Except for finitely many points, so five points. 
If I take any point and I take any other point, I can connect them this way. And then there might be, in fact, I think it's, no, I better not say this. There might be a few pairs of points that can't be connected. But even those pairs of points can get connected to everything else. So, for example, the Tukarski table, Tukarski showed this point cannot get connected to this point. All right, well, once you unfold it, blah, blah, blah. This point can't be connected to this point. But any other, this point can be connected to any other point. And if I take any points that aren't these two points, they can be connected. Okay, so, uh, and so, it, this is kind of implicit in what I've been saying, but you can go now back from the statement about surfaces to a statement about billiards. Um, and you can take the two points that are connected over here. So here's, here's my light source, or my cue ball, uh, and there's the corresponding point over there, a corresponding point over there, and there's my eight ball, what I want to hit with my light, and there's a corresponding point over there. And now, going backwards, we have line segments connecting. And look at that complicated billiard trajectory that came out of this process. So I, to me, that is a beautiful consequence of this very deep theorem about moving surfaces in the space of all surfaces. Um, due to Mario Mursicani and her collaborators. So let me just give you some, a couple of references. So, so the first is, um, and this is what inspired this talk in the first place. This is a, a number file on YouTube. It's a, it's a wonderful reference. They, they give all sorts of examples of mathematical uh, phenomena. And my colleague, Howard Mazur, at the University of Chicago, did one of these, and he explained the beginnings of this theory of this illumination problem. Um, and then the, the work that I'm referring to um, about this illumination problem, about the actual application of the Eskin uh, uh, kind of body result, uh, is due to Liliev, Monte, and Weiss. And they have a paper called Everything is Illuminated Except Finally Many Points. And now I think see what that is about. And this is um, a paint. So I mentioned that I had a friend who, who speaks Farsi. Uh, he's also a painter and a mathematician. And when I showed him the calligraphy, the first page, he's the one who pointed out um, that what Rumi was saying was a little more intense than the initial uh, interpretation or translation that I saw. And he made this painting uh, in honor of Mursakani. Uh, Surfaces can be 
these several pieces glued together. You want to make sure that they're not overlapping themselves. More questions? So there's a question. They don't always close up for sure. For sure they don't. But but here's a question that in general is an open question for billiard tables. If I have a billiard table, just a plain old billiard table, is there any trajectory that closes up? That comes back to where it starts and just repeats itself? So that would be, that would correspond to, believe it or not, this like a circle sort of winding around my surface. And for billiard tables that are not rational, for rational billiard tables, they always have closed orbits. But if I take an irrational billiard table, in fact, I don't even, I perhaps should correct myself because I'm not sure this is even the, um, for rational, but if I take a triangle, and I assume that this angle is greater than, say, 100 degrees. And I just look at this as a billiard table. So I can't necessarily unfold this, because these might not be rational. It's not known whether there's a single trajectory that closes up. It might be nuts. It's an open question. How did you get interested in like uh, like I'm called in dynamic systems like topology? How did you get interested in that? How did I get interested in dynamical systems? Yeah. I was a I was an undergraduate in college and um, I was not in fact liking any of my math classes. I was a student at Harvard and I found the classes to be um, I found the math that I had seen so far to be what I would think of, what I would almost call a dead subject, like very static. And I had I had a summer, I went to a summer program, a research experience program. And one of the one of the kind of counselors it was a graduate student at the time. And he gave a talk about a theorem in dynamical systems called the ergodic theorem. And it was all about points. Suddenly they were moving. <laughs> it's a theorem about trajectories. And I thought it was incredible. And I, I suddenly realized that mathematics could be dynamic, things could move. <laughs> and that was, I mean, I took some courses when I was an undergrad, and that's what I decided to do when I, when I went to grad school. So it was sort of a gradual thing, but um, there was that, like a moment where I realized temperamentally this was the right like, field for me. Yes, please. What happens uh, when the surface doesn't have an end? Namely, it goes it's like infinite. a hyperbolic, it goes from infinity It's not compact. To... Right. So, for example, you could take... Hyperbolic. You could take this. Yeah, so if you take this. So imagine just taking a bunch right. of... Right? So if I glued, like, if I just glue opposite edges in this surface, the surface I'm going to get is not going to be a finite type. It'll have infinitely many holes. You can still ask about um, what happens to trajectories here. That's a very interesting question because of the lack of compactness. And in fact, you, you see, you can see behaviors that look very much like a random walk on the integers. You know, things that go out and then they come back and then. So it's it's a field that's been developed more recently, but even like Barack Weiss, for example, the people I mentioned, um, has done serious work on studying such things. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sure. Yes. Hi, so um, I was wondering what type of theory was used in the um, proof of the theorem. Right. Uh, well, it used an analysis of and then it's a lot of theory is the answer, um, but it built on some ideas of the earlier work, very famous earlier work of a mathematician named Marina Ratner. Now this was not the only ingredient, and you 
needed to be profoundly generalized. But um, Marina Ratner studied um, orbits, similar orbits, but not, oh, okay, orbits. Well, orbits meaning I'm in the space of all surfaces. So I'm in this 12 dimensional space, for example, and I have these different motions I can do. You want to see like what you can fill out. Well, Marina Ratner studied a similar question, but where the objects in question were much simpler than this space of all surfaces. So she studied things called homogeneous spaces and orbits under uh, orbits of certain uh, subgroups. So it was very, it's a very sort of, um, but, but the analysis is very much like, you know, I look at two orbits and I just see like how, take two points that are very close, this is in the space of all surfaces, and like sort of see if, if over a very long time you sort of transform them in a certain direction and keep reassembling, how do they diverge from each other? So it's like a really, um, a really delicate quantitative analysis of what orbits can do and how something called polynomial divergence. Uh, then there's a completely different ingredient called the alpha of exponents, um, which is which they had to study for these kinds of transformations in the space of surfaces. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna get myself into trouble if I keep going, but I'm happy to tell you, I mean, if you want me to just talk math. Essentially, these are um, the analysis is actually I, I think is actually quite similar to things like this. So you're saying, what if I identify these two edges, right. and now I identify these two edges, but I'm going to put an arrow going in the opposite direction. So um, so if I do this, it's a cylinder, and that's all kind of fine. But now if I take these two edges and I identify them with the back reverse order, I have to take this circle, I have to pass it through the cylinder and then glue it when I get to the other end. That's called a Klein bottle. And that's actually the picture, someone asked me this. Here's a picture of a Klein bottle. I'm holding a representation, it's not a perfect representation because you can't really draw this in three dimensions, but I, that's what I'm holding on, on the, the art that illustrates the program. Okay, so you could talk about lines, but see what happens here. So if I go here, let, let's say I cross here. Now, where do I have to come out? I have to, if I'm going to come out over here, I'm going to have to switch my orientation. So if I want to analyze these things, what I would do is, is call take a double cover. So I would take two copies, if I take two copies of a, a Klein bottle and I glue them together, so I, I, I cut this and I glue it together, I'm back, I, I actually get a surface, a torus again. So I could do, I could analyze the non-orientable things by by doubling them. So if you actually, going back to the discussion, this type of... You would never get this. Steel. If you had a weird billiard table, it, a billiard table would never produce this type of thing when you do one folding. This would never happen. You could still talk if, about. If you go backwards, then you would have some weird. Yeah, I mean, there wouldn't even really be a way to go backwards mm -hmm. because this would never happen. So, like, there's no notion, there's no idea of direction here because there's no orientation. So even the question about lines is not, it doesn't even really make sense on a surface like this. So one can think of these types of objects. You could think about these types of objects, sure. This is, so the orientable surfaces look like donuts with a certain number of poles, 
the non-orientable surfaces, you know, look, look like this. With if you want, you could, you know, put Mickey Mouse ears on this, and now you've got. I mean, that was similar classification. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what the correlation was between the number of dimensions you have to work in and how many holes are in your like forest shape. And oh yeah, so the formula we were talking about this twelve-dimensional space that she lives in, right? It, the formula it's a six G minus six-dimensional space. Whoops, minus six, where G is the number of holes of the genus. And this is called. Um, and then this is called the moduli space. I mentioned this at the beginning. This is the moduli space. It, it's, in fact, the, the, the kind of world she was working in, it was this, a little bit bigger dimensional. It's actually uh, I think 12 G minus 13 dimensional because it includes direction. I'm sorry, not 12 G minus 13. Uh, 6 G, uh, uh, th there's, there's uh, one more dimension because of directions. But, Okay. So if there's one more question, let's say maybe 